recently, uh, my wife and I, Christine, who runs the business with me, um, we bought a house about a year ago, and we tried. We decided to just, you know, try all these things that we've been thinking about, and just push it a little bit further than we've gone so far. So, uh, we bought this. Uh, we bought this house in uh, the Ronsville's neighborhood. It was a brick house, about 15, well, a thousand square feet plus uh, a six foot high basement. So nothing really distinct about it, divided into four small rooms, had a six foot high basement, nice and dry and nothing had been done to it. So that's really what we liked about it, nothing had been done in 50 years probably. So eventually, this is what it looks like now, it's a house an architect would love because there's a memory of, of what used to be there still imprinted on the, on the, on the front. Uh, we will eventually paint it, but this is what it looks like now. And the biggest changes were in the interior. So we we wanted, you know, we like bright spaces, open spaces, you know, one room living. So we created this great room on the ground floor. It's only about 500 square feet of the footprint. So this is probably about 450 square feet of, of living area. And uh, you know, really kind of changed everything. And in in that process, we also put a basement apartment in. Uh, I like to call it a ground floor or a ground level walkout. It's actually, it's uh, it's a really nice little apartment. It's only about 450 square feet, but that uh, that I think is is actually one thing we think about a lot these days. Is is we talk about energy efficiency, we talk about sustainability and through energy efficiency, but I think we should also be trying to add density. So let's. So this is a really easy way to do it. So that this is the apartment. And, and this is, I think, the part I get most excited about is that there's like these people living below us, and they're really, really nice. They pay us so, lots of money. And they, <laughs> they do, they're, and they happily pay us lots of money. So, we, um, what we did at the end of the day, um, I can't remember exactly what our inter, um, Sherman and Greg did all the energy testing. We we're, I don't know, we reduced the energy use by about eighty percent. I mean, the, the house was an energy pig before. We we got to about around two of the air changes. So, of course, we all want it better than that, but that's what we got to, and Sherman and Greg keep saying that that's good, don't worry, Tom. But, uh, so th here's how we did it. So I was on about a year before, or about the same time that we started gutting it. Like, there was, this, this happened very quickly. We got the house and we just started gutting it, and then design followed. So, uh, I was at a John Straub conference, and we were trying to figure out, like, how, like, really should we just be insulating this the, the way we do all of our houses? Typically, our, our retrofits have always been, you know, the three to four inches of spray foam on the inside and up the, you know, up the ceiling, and, and that was pretty good. So, uh, we had been thinking a lot about, about internal air barriers, the spray applied stone methods, and, and I remember, you know, cornering John at this conference and saying, look, how do we do this? Should I be spending all this money on that? Help me with this. So. We decided that you know it was best. To, okay, so this is the parapet. If you guys all read Architect here, this is the parapet the floor. Okay, and this is somewhere in here is like the bedroom, right? So we're looking at cross section detail. Okay, so so this is a floor joist. So really, we talked about this, and he said, look, just spray foam the walls. Your air that's good, but you, know, you see that it's you kind of put that in, and you think you're fine, right? And Meanwhile, on the roof, we, this is this is the, the experimental section. We did this polyvinyl style roof. We started by stripping the roof. They even resheathed it in a lot of places. And this is our low level air barrier. So yeah, great blue skin everywhere here. Blue skin, and then parapets. Keep that in mind. And then we covered everything with six inches of insulation. You know, what can be better than that? It was all staggered. And it's polyvinyl. So we actually did get some flat because because of the use of vinyl, but that's a that's a whole other uh, discussion. Uh, interesting mechanicals we, because we figured the the heating loads were so small, we're just going to run some tubes in the floors. Uh, that could be a presentation in itself, and we haven't actually gone through the winter, so we'll see how well that works. We're quite confident, but it, it, it you know I have I have worried about it a little bit. Importantly, we did this um, uh, a mini split um, ventilation and cooling. It's also supplementary heating, and we did that for both units. So this is actually mirrored, and there's a, there's a similar unit like this. There's a I call it a ducted ductless mini split. So it's you know it's like a mini split without the box that gets shoved into a duct. And so that's somewhere somewhere in here, and that distributes your heating and cooling through the rooms. 
one of the big problems you have in these small houses, if you have a ductless mini split and you have like four little bedrooms, it's hard to distribute that. So these, there's a very little short ducts that, that brings that cold air and ventilation when you need it. So it kind of piggybacks on the HRV ducts, right? The HRV ducts are a little bit hot, hot, like bigger, so you can deliver a bit cooler. And then, you know, you do the you know, power pipe, which is, I think that's kind of neat. But one of the things that um, we learned here is that, you know, we stress out a lot about thermal bridging, air tightness, all of the dimension is sound. And this is the first time that we really thought about sound, because if you want, you know, density, I think it's really, really important. Sustainability depends on density, all that stuff, transit, land use. For more people to live on top of each other, you need sound attenuation. And sound attenuation actually makes thermal control and air control seem easy. You know, understanding how to control sound. So this is our first really good attempt at it. Uh, this, is a, this is a ground floor basement apartment down here. Um, my understanding was you have to have a, a very heavy ceiling, very thick, detached from everything else. So we've got these resilient channels on these special like little bumpers. The partition walls don't touch it. Um, the, the drywall goes right to the, the edges of, of the foundations. And I think it works pretty well, but uh, it's just something to consider. Like we, I think we can spend a lot more time on these kinds of things. But, and then what went wrong? A lot of things went wrong. So that's the part that I really want to focus on. Shervin did the blower door test, and we were, I don't know, it was three or four. And what happened? You know, like, how could this happen to us? You know? So, this is a just this is a little cathedral ceiling. Most of the roof is flat. This is one of those weird little Toronto houses that has the, you know, the pitched roof, so it still looks like a house, but that's flat on the back. So, uh, by the way, this is low density. This is half pound foam. So this isn't there for the air because we didn't need the air control of this layer because we had behind this we had that that blue skin layer that was supposed to control all the air. So we are getting quite a lot of leaking here. By the way, we also had some really bad leaking in the really dumb places like around the HRV intakes, like places that we should have caught. John Straub saying just manage the easy places you know, where the pipes go through the walls, surprisingly, and I think that had to do with a lot of just not having enough good management on site, because I was the one managing on site. <laughs> so, so, but then, those are the easy ones, right? So those, mostly we dealt with those, but then we're getting these mystery leaks, and a lot of them are along the ridge of this, ridge of this uh, little cathedral ceiling. And what was happening just above that, do you remember this great air barrier, da -da -da? Look at how that air barrier joined to here. And I just dug this picture up, and it, you know, looking at it now just means so much more. Like, I'm not really sure what I was thinking, but like, there's just no way that you can actually get an air seal between that piece of blue skin and this air pit. It looked really solid in the drawing. You know, it was very <laughs> defined, strong line in the drawing. And even if you did get, you did get a strong connection between the blue skin and the air pit, this thing is a sponge. Who cares? Like there is so many cracks. You can see daylight through these pyramids. So we were, we we're, I'm afraid, kind of damned from the get go, just right here. The more I learned too was that from Sherbin was that um, these problems are kind of unforgiving. That crack, even if you think you've look, like that's not a local problem because I could have air leakage around my skylight, which is at the other corner of the house. It could travel between that airtight layer and the sheathing, find its way all the way back through here. So the amazing thing about air is that it just kind of finds its way out. So, so Sherman and I spent uh, you know an afternoon finding all these things, and then I spent another day just caulking, and that helped. Right? Um, funny little places where, you know, like sh why should you have a sill gasket on a, like on the internal partition, you know, the, the framing when you know, all your air control is supposed to be here. Well, it would have just helped. I'm not sure what the science is, but we know that if we had a double sill gasket under here, it would have stopped a lot of the air leakage along the sill plate. Because for some reason or other, that spray foam wasn't actually sealing everywhere. And well, look at this. I mean, this, the spray foam is sealing to this, but this is not that continuous. So it's all very clear now. One of the things is this is a little mystery leak. And this is what makes an architect stay up at night and worry, right? Like you do all of this, and you're you're backing, you know, you're backing this this 
this masonry wall with an air barrier and the thermal control layer, and yet you're still not really managing basic water control. Like you kind of ask yourself, oh my gosh, like why did we do that? So this was this was telling. There was a crack. It was just a little hole in in the brick, and and the roof was draining onto it. But it started to make me you know question. Like we had two thirds of the equation here. Maybe we didn't have, but we didn't have the first step, which was the water control layer. It's probably fine, but it makes you wonder. Then there was this, a bit of a debacle around the windows, and I would I would call this um, overthinking and under investigation, maybe under investigating. We I think we probably only stripped the trim off of one of the windows when we stripped it, and that was probably the only window that didn't actually have lead weights. Uh, you know, that didn't have the of course, every other window. So, so then we went to this great extent of ordering windows with, with brick molds because I really wanted to get that nice wrap of, of spray foam in and sealing to the back of the brick mold. So we we're so could, because normally you just have that you would only have that like sort of half inch layer and you just sort of spray it, like this thin film of spray foam in. So I was like, let's give it you know an inch and three eighths, and then we ended up getting like three inches because there's all this extra space, which was worse. And then, you know, the carpenters framed to the inner brick, the windows were sized to the outer brick with extra space, and all of a sudden you had this extra thing, and then I came to the job site and saw these growths coming out of the side <laughs> of the windows. And, and, yes, and every single one of these we had to call, right? Each one of these little layers is a potential layer of... Yeah, so... So at the end of the day, so everything else kind of worked out except the air tightness. We still got under two, which Sherman tells me is a great thing. Um, I feel pretty good about it. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, so if you, you know, this is where the air leakage was before, this is where we are now. You know, not bad. Significant reduction. There's huge reductions in these guys, right? So, but it's interesting. Mm -hmm. This, this could have come down more. So the next project we'd like to go down to about half of that at least. You should be. Should be at I'd like to be at point I, don't, I can't even read these decimals. <laughs> uh, so if if I could do it all over again, I would have just sprayed the whole outside of the building with black polychemical something acronymy type products. I would have just I would have sprayed the whole outside with, with a liquid applied air barrier. I would have done the whole foundation with the liquid applied air barrier, and I wouldn't have batted an eye because it's an it was an ugly brick house. It's still an ugly brick house, right? It's just it would have been fantastic. This is um, I just dug up uh, Joel Steberg's article, Deep Dish Renovations, and it, you know I, I think I'd read it a while ago, but it, it made a lot more sense to me now. I read